Glad to see everyone today. Um, you can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. I find a title for my uh, sharing today. What I call it is the pigsty, the church, and the bridal chamber. Three places that can keep us from experiencing God's love. If you look at the 2 Corinthians 6, look at when the Lord says he'll be a father to us. If you look at verse 16 and 17 and 18. Verse 17, sorry. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me. The thing that struck me is, when does he say he'll be a father to us? Is it while we're in the midst of our sin, when we're touching what's unclean, when we're not separated from the world? No, it's when we come out. And there's a call to come out, and it's when we come out that the author of fatherhood is ours. And when we, when we can truly claim, God is my father, it's when I decide to come out from the world. And when I decide I'm not going to touch anything that's unclean. And that's what it takes practically to enjoy God as our father, is coming out of this world. And coming out of these wrong ways of thinking, not touching anything unclean. And as I've looked at my own life and as I've thought about when do I experience God as a father and what are some things that keep me from experiencing the love of God as my father, I was surprised as I thought about it. Um, and the three things that I would say, three areas where I have to come out or because they can keep me from experiencing God's love, the father's love, are the pigsty, the church, and the bridal chamber. In Luke 15, you don't have to turn there because we know the story. It's what I'll spend the least amount of time with because it's the most obvious. But it's the story of the prodigal son. And what's interesting to me is when the prodigal son, or the point is, when the prodigal son left, his father didn't go with him. He had enjoyed sonship. He had enjoyed a relationship with his father. And then he chose to leave. He took his inheritance and he left. And the father did not go with him. He went on his own. And as far as I can tell, he had no experience, no practical present experience of his father's love when he was in the other country, when he was in the pigsty. And it's only when, it's, when he came to his senses that he experienced his father's love again, that his father welcomed him. But it was when he came out, as it says in 2 Corinthians, when he came out and he said, I'm not going to touch what's unclean anymore. And to me, the pigsty represents willful pursuit of what we know is wrong. If, we're willfully, if, we're, if we are willfully pursuing what we know is wrong, we're not going to experience the love of God. But the second thing is more is a little bit more surprising is the church. If you turn to Amos, this struck me as we were in our study of Amos this week. Amos chapter 5. Look with me at verse 21, please. Amos 5:21. This is the Lord speaking to his people. He says, "I hate, I reject your festivals." nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. You who, if you look at verse 18, you're longing for the day of the Lord. There are people who are longing for the day of the Lord, and yet the Lord's response to them is, I hate your festivals. Even though you offered me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I'm not going to accept them. I won't even look at your peace offerings of your fatlings. Verse 23, stop singing to me. I won't even listen if you play your music. Verse 24, why? You've neglected justice. <coughs> And you're not seeking to be righteous constantly in every area of your life. And what this says to me is that there are people who we can be longing for the day of the Lord. We can be gathering for religious purposes. I can busy myself with all sorts of act act religious activities. But my religious service means nothing to the Lord. And I won't experience the love of my Father, even in the midst of all those activities, if righteousness is not like an ever-flowing stream in my life if I'm not constantly and continually seeking to live rightly before the Lord. I won't practically experience his love in my life. In fact, you know, in the book of Malachi, almost the entire book is dedicated to a warning to people who are doing things in the name of God. And God says, I just wish you'd shut the door. I wish someone would be brave enough to just call the whole thing off. Because just because you are involved in religious ritual and church ritual, it doesn't mean that I'm pleased with you. And the church, to me, represents 
an attitude of having service uh, or a longing to serve as a replacement for righteous living. We start to think in some sense like our religious activity can balance out unrighteous living in our lives. And um, we can think that religious activity is a replacement for true and simple devotion to the Lord Jesus. And if we, if we allow that attitude to persist, you know, we, don't, we don't really take sin seriously, but we say, hey, at least I'm doing a bunch of stuff. At least I'm meeting with the brothers. At least I'm seeking to prophesy. The love of God is going to remain out of our reach. Sin in the camp makes the whole of our religious life and all of our religious practice a stench. And I have to be wary of that, that the church and my involvement in a church can actually keep me from the love of God if I allow it to be a cover-up for unrighteous living and a lack of a constant, ever-flowing stream. We see the same picture of separation from, the, from God's love in the Song of Solomon, if you turn there. But what's interesting is it's the bride is not in the Song of Solomon, if you look at chapter 3. She's not in the pigsty, but she's separated from the Lord. She's not even practicing her religion, but she's separated from the Lord. What's interesting is she's in her bridal chamber. And yet, what she says, if you look at Song of Solomon, chapter 3 and verse 1 is, On my bed, night after night, I sought him, whom my soul loves. I love him, and I'm seeking him. I'm diligent to seek him night after night. And yet, she says, I sought him and did not find him. Why? Why? Can you imagine someone who's, who's been brought into the bridal chamber? In, in you know, chapter 1 of Song of Solomon, in verse um, 4, it says, The king has brought me into his chambers. This is someone who, who has entered into a bridal relationship with the Lord. In chapter 3, in verse 4, it says, He's brought me to his banqueting hall, and his banner over me is love. This is someone who's had a rich experience of the Lord's goodness. And yet, in chapter 3, verse 1, she says, I'm laying on my bed, and I'm seeking the Lord, and yet I can't find him. Has anybody ever, is that your testimony? It's been my testimony at times. Laying on my bed saying, I can't find him. Why? Why can't she find him on her bed? Seems like such a good thought, right? I'm in the bridal chamber. I'm seeking the Lord. Here's the problem. If you look at chapter 2, it says in verse 9, just before this, it says, my beloved is standing behind our wall. He's looking through the windows. He's peering through the lattice. She can't totally see him, but she knows he's looking for her. He's looking for her. That's a wonderful thing to remember. Our Lord is always looking for us. We might think, I'm looking for him. I'm searching for him, and I just can't find him right now. That is not true. Our Lord is always looking for us. But look what happens. In verse 10, my beloved, the bridegroom says, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. He's inviting her out of the bridal chamber. He says in verse 12, or 11, the, the winter's past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers have already appeared in the land. The time has arrived for pruning the vines. Let's get to work together, he says. The voice of the turtle dove has been heard in our land. The fig tree is ripened. Again in verse 13, arise, my darling, my beautiful one, and come along. But then you look at her response in chapter 3. She said, on my bed I sought him night after night. He's gone. On my bed I sought him. It sounds nice, but remember, he was saying, come along. And she doesn't actually get up. That's what that says to me. He's inviting her, and she stays in her bed saying, no, 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 I'm just going to cherish precious thoughts about you. It says in verse 16 of chapter 2, my beloved is mine and I am his. Doesn't that sound like such a wonderful thought? My beloved is mine, I am his. Here's the problem. He asked her to get up, and she didn't rise and follow him. And she lays on her bed and she cherishes these precious thoughts about her bridegroom. But the problem is he left. And I think we can read that verse and think, wow, what a precious thing to say. It is not precious if we're ignoring the Lord's call. It's not precious to just cherish how I am my beloved and he is mine. If, I'm, if he has asked me to get up. And this is where the, we can get tripped up too, I think. We can say, I'm my beloved, he is mine. We comfort ourselves with thoughts about him, but we're ignoring his actual instructions. He's actually asked us to do something. He's asked us to come out and be separate. He's asked us to put away and those unclean things. Don't touch them anymore. And um, he calls us, maybe it's to get out of a certain situation. It's to get out of a certain thought pattern, a, a certain attitude, and we sit back and we rest on our profession. We say, I know he's my Lord. 
and we don't really take his call seriously. Maybe it's because we see it or hear it through the lattice, so to speak. It's through the window. I'm not totally sure if that's exactly what he's saying to me, so I'm just going to sit here. I'm not going to totally take seriously what he says because it's not quite clear yet. And Christ is calling us out. And we may be surprised, just like her in, in, if in verse 3, we say, I'm, I've been laying on my bed seeking him who my soul loves, and yet I can't find him. And we need to say what she says in verse 2. I must arise now. And, and I have found in my own life when I feel the love of God is not so present in my life. Sometimes what I need to do is I need to go back to the last instruction I've received and see, have I fully obeyed? Have I fully submitted to his call when he's asked me to come out of some way of thinking or some pattern of behavior or some attitude? Have I fully come out or am I just comforting myself? I'm my beloved's and he is mine. And I need to recognize that staying in the bridal chamber when the Lord has called me out is disobedience. And it will keep me from the love of God. Ironically, we think, if I, how is it possible to miss the love of God in the bridal chamber? And yet that's what we see. We have to obey without delay. Her problem was she got up too late. She says, I have to arise now. And if you look in verse 2 and 3, I kept seeking him and I couldn't find him. And we heard recently Delayed obedience is disobedience. Negligence is what often separates us from the love of God. In chapter 5, if you turn there, the same thing happens to her again. Look at 5 verse 6. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and had gone. And my heart went out to him as he spoke, and I searched for him, and I couldn't find him. I called for him, but he didn't answer me. Again, this is the bride who's been brought into the... Um, King's chamber, this is the one who said his banner over me is love, and yet I open to him and he's gone. Why? It's because she tarried. Look at verse 2. I was asleep, but my heart was awake. A voice, my beloved, was knocking. Open, my sister, my darling, my dove, my perfect one. There's clearly a love relationship here. My head is drenched with dew, the bridegroom says. My locks with the lamp of night. And you know what the bride says? It's not a good time. It's not convenient. I've already taken off my dress. How can I put it back on again? My feet are clean. I don't want to get them dirty. This is an inconvenient time for you to call me, Lord. I don't want this instruction right now. I don't want you to call me out of this right now. It's not really, the timing's not to my liking. And to me, the bedchamber represents nice thoughts about the Lord, which cover up a reluctance to obey if he's not perfectly clear and the instruction's not perfectly convenient. But remaining even in my bedchamber can keep me from the love of God. As I said, all three of these things, the pigsty, the church, the bridal chamber, all of these can keep me from experiencing the love of God. Um, the pigsty we definitely get, right? It's the most obvious. Of course God's love isn't real as we're actively seeking sin. Um, but why did, So why did I even mention it? Because it's so obvious. To me, there are two reasons it's important to mention the pigsty in this context. One is... I don't know how many of us see thinking precious thoughts in the bridal chamber every bit as dangerous as the pigsty. I don't know how many of us see activity in a religious life as every bit as dangerous to our devotion to the Lord, potentially, as the pigsty. The pigsty is obviously dangerous to us. We know we can't willfully sin and, and experience and enjoy the love of the Father, but we can think, we can comfort ourselves with these precious thoughts and still wonder, and that's where we can be deceived. We go, why am I not experiencing God's love? It's because I'm reluctant to obey. And we can, be act we can be busy with activity in the church. We can be doing all sorts of service. We can say, why am I not experiencing the love of God? It's because righteousness is not like an ever-flowing stream in our lives. And we have to see these two things as every bit as serious as the prodigal's pigsty. All of us will say the prodigal's pigsty is a dangerous place to be. Will we see that the bridal chamber and the church are as well? And then the other reason that I mentioned the pigsty is I want to encourage anybody who finds they're convicted of willfully seeking out something which they know is displeasing to the Lord. If there's anybody who's been proactively seeking sin, you are no farther away necessarily than the bride in the bridal chamber. You're no farther away than the diligent member in the middle of church service, meaning you can be restored to the Father's loving embrace very quickly. If you seek to turn, you might think, man, I'm in the pigsty. At least she's in the bridal chamber. Your fellowship with the Lord can be restored just as quickly. 
you might think, oh man, at least they're serving in the church. I've willfully been seeking sin. You can be restored every bit as quickly. You just have to turn from your sin and run to the Lord. And the Father is um, <coughs> eager to meet you. So um, may God help us and deliver us from all the deceptions which keep us from actually experiencing his love. It has to be an actual reality. It's not enough that we know that he loves us. We have to be able to say, his love is better to me than life. It's better to me than anything in my life. It's better to me than lying on my bed in the bridal chamber and having good thoughts. It's better to me than any of my church service. His love is the very best thing. And if we find in our lives that we can't say that presently, we should seek to examine, is it a pigsty problem? Is it a bridal chamber problem? Is it a church service problem? What is the cause for my separation from the love of God? And sometimes when it's not the pigsty, it can be harder to pinpoint, but those other reasons are every bit as dangerous. So may God help us.